Welcome everybody to the uh, panel discussion uh, on marriage equality in North Carolina. I'm Daryl Miller. I'm a professor of law here at uh, Duke University Law School. I teach civil procedure, civil rights, state and local government law, uh, and I'm delighted to have um, our guests here, our two panelists, and our special guest um, who uh, are going to speak on the uh, marriage equality litigation uh, and offer their insight. Uh, I think it's going to be a great program. Uh, so my first uh, panelist uh, is Elizabeth Gill, who is the senior staff attorney with the ACLU. Uh, she litigates cases across the country on matters uh, that relate to equal treatment of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people, uh, and the reproductive and civil rights of women. Prior to that, she uh, worked at the uh, uh, Morrison and Forrester in San Francisco and William, uh, Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C. Uh, she's a graduate of Harvard Law School and my classmate, and also uh, clerked on the Sixth Circuit for the Honorable uh, Karen Nelson Moore. Uh, our second panelist is our own Neil Siegel, uh, the David W. Eichel Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science and co-director of the program in public law and director of the D.C. Summer Institute uh, on Law and Policy. He teaches here in matters of constitutional law, federal courts, uh, and constitutional theory. Uh, I will say right away that Professor Siegel has uh, another engagement, so he's going to have to leave about uh, 125 during the Q&A, uh, but we're glad that uh, Neil can uh, join us and give us some of his insights to today's event. Uh, in the audience, uh, we have two special guests. Uh, the first is Mayor uh, Mark Kleinschmidt, is the mayor of the uh, city of Chapel Hill. Uh, mayor Kleinschmidt was one of the attorneys uh, who litigated on behalf of plaintiffs in one of uh, the important uh, North Carolina uh, cases, uh, United Church of Christ versus Cooper. Uh, and the other special guest is Christopher Brook, who is the legal director of the ACLU, of North Carolina. He's a native of North Carolina and has been involved heavily uh, in spearheading this uh, litigation here in North Carolina. So the format is going to be as follows. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists, beginning with um, Elizabeth Gill, uh, to speak for about 15 minutes uh, each. Um, Elizabeth is going to give us a little bit of the overview and the litigation <laughs> perspective. Uh, Professor uh, Siegel is going to sort of put that in a, a theoretical and scholarly context with respect to sort of the arc of due process, equal protection, federalism, and other uh, matters in which he's um, very well acquainted and an expert on. Um, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over. Uh, the mics actually should be on. I'm going to turn it over to our guests, uh, uh, Mayor uh, Kleinschmidt. Uh, and Chris Brook uh, to offer uh, about five minutes or so of their own perspective on the, the litigation, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A, uh, and you can uh, tell us what's on your mind. And with that, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. I'm just going to have to adjust the microphone <laughs> far down here. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd just give um, a quick overview of kind of the, you know, there's just been such an enormous change in the landscape um, of relationship recognition for uh, same-sex couples around the country. I, I personally started at the ACLU in 2008, um, and I work out of the ACLU San Francisco office, and so I came in right as we had won marriage in California uh, and <clears throat> was thrown into the Prop 8 campaign. Um, and times have really, really changed. So I just thought it's it's sometimes better to, to absorb the impact of that visually. And, um, you know, one thing that we at the National ACLU do a whole lot of is looking at maps, um, which is trying to figure out what's happening. And, and I, you know, we do this in, in a lot of our areas of work. Um, and the map is looking really great for us right now on uh, marriage recognition for same-sex couples. Um, but I'll just give you a little history historical tour because it really wasn't all that long ago uh, that, that things were completely different. So this is the map of relationship recognition in 2000. Um, so uh, less than 15 years ago, there is no state in the United States that allows same-sex couples to marry. Um, there's tentative recognition, statewide recognition of um, you know, domestic partnerships. Vermont is the only state in the country that has comprehensive civil unions. 
Um, so moving quickly forward, five years later, MAP is not that much different. <laughs> so now we're, we're less than 10 years ago, um, and there's only one state, Massachusetts, where same-sex couples can marry. Um, comprehensive domestic partnerships have a stronger toehold uh, in the um, Northeast, which is um, probably the region of our country that's been most progressive on the rights of LGBT people, um, and California, uh, which has a mixed record. Um, 2010, five years later, <laughs> you know, and now we're, we're under five years from now. Uh, you know, it's looking better. Um, you know, we have uh, five states where same-sex couples can marry and a couple other states that are um, like a rainbow of good colors, um, which means some kind of recognition, um, some openness to recognizing marriages from other states. Uh, folks may know that New York started as a state that just recognized out-of-state marriages for same-sex couples long before it actually had marriage on its own. Uh, so that's 2010. 2013, last year, um, things are good. We had a good election in 2012. Um, we picked up um, at the ballot three states, Washington, um, Minnesota, and Maine, uh, and uh, four states, and Maryland. And, um, and you know, we're, we have seen also the spread, um, even to places like Colorado, of comprehensive domestic partnerships. Um, so <laughs> this year... June. <laughs> um, things are looking good. Um, they're, they're, you know, we have, um, through the federal courts, we have uh, marriage in California and Oregon through the state courts. We have marriage in New Mexico and uh, Illinois. Um, federal court also Pennsylvania. Uh, um, New Jersey, that, that's the legislature. Hawaii, that's the legislature. So sort of a range of ways to get there. Um, but this is now um, less than six months ago. <laughs> um, and then this October, um, and, and I should say that um, in June of 2013, um, the Windsor case came down from the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and that case, as folks I think probably know, was about the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, which limited for the federal government uh, the definition to, of marriage to between a man and a woman. Um, that was an ACLU case. We're very proud of our client, Edie Windsor, um, and had an amazing, amazing story to tell uh, and, and won big in the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and although the, court, um, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Windsor decision was careful to say that it wasn't ruling on whether individual states could constitutionally um, ban marriage for same-sex couples, it for sure opened the door to a floodgate of federal litigation. Um, so prior to the Windsor decision, uh, there were not many state um, cases in federal court challenging um, bans like Amendment 1 here in North Carolina. Um, there was the Perry case famously out of California, which went up to the Supreme Court at the same time as the Windsor case. Uh, and the Supreme Court ducked, <laughs> um, and through ducking gave us marriage in California, um, which we can, we'll get there, but it seems to be the way the Supreme Court wants to handle these marriage questions is to duck them and that let marriage happen. Um, but um, uh, but uh, there was not, um, you know, in most states there weren't um, federal cases uh, arguing in the federal courts marriage for same-sex couples. Subsequent to Windsor, we've had a, a tidal wave of cases filed uh, and cases won, um, including these, uh, these in North Carolina. Um, so this is June of this year. All of these cases are working themselves up. You, um, starting in 2014, you really have a federal case uh, filed in almost every state. Um, and some of these cases, well, some of these cases start to go up to the federal circuits. Um, so cases earlier this year, uh, we got a great decision this, this uh, past summer out of the Tenth Circuit, um, which was then followed by a decision um, out of the Fourth and, and a decision out of the Seventh. And those cases were all teed up um, with cert petitions in the U.S. Supreme Court this October. Um, I'll get to what I think about that in a second. But so here we are. Here is relationship recognition as of June. This is relationship restrictions. So, you know, we, I don't know. <laughs> 
I mean, we might have to rethink the whole blue state, red state thing, but that's the theme that's going on in our maps. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the blue states indicate, you know, pro-marriage equality. Uh, the red states, but the red states, I mean, this is look, still looking very, very restrictive. Um, June of this year, October 6, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court denied cert in the cases pending from Utah, from um, Wisconsin, and from Virginia, which, you know, the, the 10th, um, 7th, and 4th circuits, respectively. And by doing so, they opened up marriage um, in all of those circuits. All of those circuits had ruled in favor of marriage equality for same-sex couples, and by denying cert, um, that those uh, rulings went into effect in those circuits, bringing marriage down on 11 new states um, overnight. So this is October 6th. Um, uh, with you can see the the new blue states are the states that were actually um, you know Virginia's case was actually the case that was denied cert. The mandate went into effect immediately. Couples started getting married right away. Um, same with uh, Wisconsin. Um, the next day, um, the Ninth Circuit comes out with its opinion on marriage equality from a case in Idaho, and uh, with um, the idea that if the Supreme Court denied cert in, in, um, in the Tenth, Fourth, and Seventh cases, it is very likely not to take cert in the Ninth. Um, they, uh, uh, and there was complicated shenanigans that went on in some of the states for a couple of days, but basically that brought marriage um, to four new states. And so by the time you get to um, the second week of October, um, we now have uh, 32 states in which same-sex couples can get married, which essentially doubles the number from a year ago. Um, since this map, since we put together this map for a presentation, I literally did last week. Um, <laughs> Kansas now has marriage. <laughs> um, uh, South Carolina, the judge there is doing some public thinking. Um, Montana, we should get um, in very short order. Um, and Wyoming has marriage. So uh, the, the map is even bluer as of today uh, than, it was, <laughs> than it was last week. So um, this is, and, and this is where we now are in terms of marriage restrictions. So, um, uh, you know, not looking good, but, but a much, much narrower slice of America. Most people now live in a state, you know, sort of solidly most people now live in a state in the United States where they can marry their same-sex partner. Um, the world has truly changed um, just in a matter of a few years. Um, so this leaves us with, you know, this handful of states. There are still outstanding circuits. Uh, the, the circuits that haven't ruled on marriage are conservative circuits, so the 5th, the 8th, the 11th. Um, the 6th, um, cases are briefed, fully briefed. The 6th heard oral argument um, some months ago. We don't know what we'll, we'll, we'll see out of the six. Um, but, but, um, but I think, you know, the litigators on the ground expect that, um, well, I'll let Neil talk about, you know, sort of the theory of this and, and, you know, he can maybe better surmise what the Supreme Court was thinking than I can. Um, I can say from the perspective of the advocates on the ground, we were very surprised. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, no one expected the Supreme Court to deny cert in all these cases, leading to an effect of such an enormous expansion of the actual freedom to marry. Because once you expand it, it's very hard to unwind it, right? So, um, uh, <laughs> We were we were we were all surprised, and um, there was quite a bit of scrambling that happened um, in the two weeks subsequent to the uh, Supreme Court's cert denials. All for the good, because now a lot of states have marriages. Um, and you know, I think from our perspective, we think that this is a battle that we have largely won. Um, it's possible that we lose in the Supreme Court going up from a circuit that. Um, that denies the freedom to marry. Just as a fun fact for you, uh, uh, you know, with the 33 states that we have as of right now, um, that leaves 17 states that don't have the freedom to marry. Um, when the Supreme Court overturned bans on interracial marriage in 1967, there were, in fact, exactly 17 states that continued to ban uh, interracial marriage. And when the Supreme Court overturned um, school segregation uh, in 1957, there were exactly 17 states 
uh, that still um, segregated their public schools. Um, so maybe 17 is a magical number, and the Supreme Court will now rule in our favor. Um, in 2003, uh, when um, Lawrence v. Texas struck down criminal sodomy bans, there were 14 of those. And certainly, I think by the time there's any possibility of a case getting into this Supreme Court, we will have more states where there's the freedom to marry than 33. So it will be closer to, to, closer to 14. Um, just to move quickly on, because we don't have much time, in North Carolina, uh, you know, the, the evolution of our lawsuit here, I think, tracks what has been happening around the country. Um, North Carolina, we always viewed it um, just from a national litigation perspective as a great state to bring a case, um, you know, a federal freedom to marry case or other cases involving the rights of LGBT people. Uh, and that is in part because there's a very large LGBT community here in North Carolina. Um, and given the way that this state is um, is composed, there are very strong LGBT communities where people feel really comfortable being out, um, and there's a lot of, you know, not statewide political support, I would not say, but um, certainly there's local political support, and, and that really matters for, for tackling some of these bigger questions. Um, so in 2012, the ACLU brought a lawsuit here in North Carolina um, in the Middle District, not arguing marriage at that time, but arguing instead that gay couples uh, should that it, it was it should be unconstitutional to prevent gay couples um, from entering into second parent adoption. So where you have one adoptive or bio parent um, to make sure that the family can have two legal parents. A, a bad decision from the North Carolina Supreme Court had come down a couple of years previously prohibiting that, um, and you know we sued on that ground. So even as of 2010. We did not feel that the door was necessarily open to bring a marriage suit here in North Carolina, even though, again, there are good state federal courts and the Fourth Circuit on the whole, um, looking at a map of the nation and thinking about the federal circuits out there, is a progressive circuit. Um, we added marriage claims in 2013, and other folks brought cases. So uh, Mark's firm brought um, its case, I think, about a year ago, um, maybe even less than that. Um, and there was a third case involving um, pro se litigants uh, in the Western District of North Carolina out of Asheville. Um, so I'll just say, um, you know, Daryl wanted, Professor Miller a little bit wanted me to talk about just, you know, sort of some of the challenges um, from a, a, a national perspective of trying to figure out how best to do this kind of litigation. And one of the challenges is we don't control it. <laughs> um, so, you know, groups like the ACLU, um, well, I would say this, that advocacy groups who um, sort of work on LGBT equality professionally, um, it, we do get together and we divide work up. So as, as civil rights movements go, I think the LGBT movement is relatively well coordinated. We don't always get along, but we mostly do. Um, and so, you know, we work with Lambda, we work with GLAAD, we work with the National Center for Lesbian Rights, we partner with them on many cases. Um, we, you know, have a map of the country and who's tracking which case and who's doing what, and it includes our colleagues in the other advocacy groups. Um, something that happened, you know, starting in 2013 after the success of, uh, of Edie Windsor's case uh, uh, in the Supreme Court, um, lots and lots of folks filed lawsuits. So private lawyers who, um, you know, to, who don't do civil rights work for a living, much less gay rights work for a living, um, and then just lots of individuals. Uh, and I think the experience in North Carolina has been, um, you know, Chris has spent a whole bunch of time talking to the, our pro se um, folks, and, you know, they were surprised that there was, that you couldn't just sort of file a complaint in court, and the court would say, yes, you have marriage. Um, so I think that's been like a big learning curve for a lot of the folks that have filed lawsuits. And I would say that everyone who does this work professionally, myself included, spends a whole lot of time on the phone um, with um, you know private lawyers or or pro se litigants who you know filed a marriage lawsuit and and then are surprised that there's more to it than that. Um, uh, and and sometimes they are there are good ideas there, and sometimes they're really wacky ideas. Um, and you know our bottom line is that we're just always trying to prevent people from making the law worse which, um, you know, some of these cases could do. So um, that's, that's sort of how we, how we handle all of that, which is to say you triage it um, where, where possible. And I think, you know, clearly one of the cases that, uh, you know, the case that goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, assuming that the court takes a case eventually, 
is going to come out of one of these um, more conservative circuits. Um, it's not necessarily going to be the kind of case that advocates would have wanted to see in the Supreme Court. Um, you know, I will say that when we bring a case or when Lambda brings a case, um, you know, we try to look for folks that have sympathetic stories, that um, are able to talk to the public in a compelling way. Um, that, you know, the visual impact of that, the public education that can be done around a case is an important part of a successful civil rights case. Edie Windsor's case was so enormously successful because she is amazing and an amazing um, spokesperson for the gay rights movement generally. Um, and, you know, that may not be the case that gets up there. Um, and that's, you know, a gamble that, that we're, we're all taking. I mean, we will all pitch in and help whatever case um, is the one that goes up, but it's entirely possible it, you know, it, well, it's known none of these circuits are the circuits that we carefully picked cases uh, to bring in those circuits because they seemed like the right circuits to, to bring them in. So none of those cases are um, the North Carolina case or the Virginia case or the Wisconsin case. Um, it's those are the states. We're, we're now left with the states where people didn't necessarily think there was going to be a good shot of winning marriage. Um, just in terms to wrap up of what's next, uh, you know, are we done? Should the LGBT movement pack up its bags and go home? No, <laughs> um, um, we shouldn't. Um, you know, I think marriage gets us a lot, and marriage um, has done just an enormous amount of work for our movement in convincing people that, you know, gay people are like everybody else, um, that we're normal, that our relationships are normal. Uh, and, you know, that's huge. And, and I think culturally we have won that fight, um, which is in part why we're winning it in the courts. Um, but there's a lot left to do. I think the thing that on the landscape that most worries us um, are the cases that are out there, some, some of it's happening in North Carolina as we speak, where folks are making arguments um, that, you know, for religious reasons, they should be able to deny service to gay people, um, to refuse to marry gay people, and wanting to lock in um, through the vehicle of, you know, making arguments about their own religion, but locking in an ability to discriminate against gay people that's different than the ability to discriminate against women, say, um, or the ability to discriminate based on race, um, and trying to make that legal and trying to push that ball forward. And, you know, the Supreme Court did us an enormous favor in denying cert and letting marriage happen in 11 states, I would say on the other side, you know, Hobby Lobby is very much being used as a symbol, um, you know, with the, the folks that tend to be our opponents in these marriage cases, um, that there's real room for the court being um, supportive of expansive ideas um, about, you know, who can, about what a kind of religious protection there is for discrimination. Um, and so these are the cases that are happening for us now. I'm litigating the case in Washington State currently um, about um, with uh, a florist that refused to provide weddings for a gay, a gay couple's, refused to provide flowers for a gay couple's wedding. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, over the summer with this clear trajectory of marriage bans falling all over the nation in the courts, um, with the Supreme Court cert denial, uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a group that supports the concepts of uh, marriage between a man and a woman, uh, you know, they have poured tons of, you know, as, 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 as they're losing on the marriage battle, they are putting more and more resources um, into, um, you know, the religious refusals cases. And so we see that um, right here in North Carolina. Um, we've been um, a, a number of, of state employees who were tasked with marrying same-sex couples uh, have, in fact, resigned from their jobs. Uh, because they don't want to, and whether they have any protected religious freedom um, is something that is, you know, sort of being discussed at a statewide level right now. So. Thanks. Neil? All right, well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Daryl. Uh, it's always awkward at these events whether you call your colleague Professor Miller or Daryl and I'm going to have to call you. Everybody else can call me Daryl. You call me Professor Miller. All right. <laughs> All right. Professor Daryl, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, Elizabeth, thank you for that. I just learned a lot. Mr. Mayor, thank you for being here. And Mr. Brook is, as well. And uh, thanks to ACS and the program in public law for, for sponsoring this 
event. So what I'll do with my time is uh, try and explain to you why I don't think uh, the U.S. Supreme Court's behavior on Monday and October 6 is as surprising as it may seem, and I should say that it also surprised the vast majority of Supreme Court watchers. So there was not a disconnect between uh, those who follow the court and those who are litigating these cases in, in the trenches. Uh, to my mind, uh, the court's behavior on October 6 and its sevenfold denial of cert is consistent with a pattern of behavior from the court dating back at least uh, until uh, to June, June of 2013 when it decided uh, Hollingsworth against Perry, as well as U.S. against Windsor, which uh, Elizabeth spoke about, and even dating back further to Lawrence against Texas in, in 2003. Lawrence was uh, the case in which the court overruled Bowers against Hardwick. Bowers against Hardwick uh, allowed states to criminalize same-sex intimacy uh, between consenting adults and the privacy of their home. And in overruling Bowers in Lawrence, uh, the court took off the table uh, the primary argument of defenders of traditional marriage, opponents of same-sex marriage, which is uh, a good faith, moral, oftentimes religious expression of moral conviction, moral opposition uh, about uh, uh, same-sex intimacy, same-sex relationships. And the court in Lawrence said that it wasn't even a rational, it wasn't even a legitimate interest under deferential judicial review uh, to express moral opposition to homosexuality. And Justice Scalia saw the writing on the wall in Lawrence, and he uh, was apoplectic, right? He had an aneurysm and said, um, you've just signed off on marriage equality. Uh, if logic and reason have anything to do uh, with what we do for a living. Uh, and Justice Kennedy insisted, no, no, I'm not talking about uh, any institution uh, he didn't mention, I think, marriage by name, uh, but he said we're not talking about abuse of an institution the law protects. Uh, but he did take off the table moral opposition to homosexuality, and that's why ever since it has not been a fair fight. Uh, you have smart lawyers defending state bans making very bad arguments, uh, and they're making very bad arguments is because it's the only ones they have. And instead of saying that this ban expresses the moral convictions uh, of the people in the state who are opposed to same-sex marriage, they have to say other things like, uh, really, marriage is about um, uh, 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 convincing or persuading or prodding irre sexually irresponsible heterosexual men uh, to take some uh, care of the children that they may accidentally produce. The idea, uh, I can sh actually show you the cases in which this is being argued. Uh, and the idea is that heterosexuals need marriage in a way that gay people don't, because gay people can't have kids by accident. So, I mean, this is, um, um, for one thing, it's insulting to the people who are defending these bans. I don't think that they think of uh, traditional marriage as being about um, really getting um, heterosexual men to uh, do something other than get drunk and get a woman pregnant and then leave town, right? Uh, in fact, Judge Posner in, in the Seventh Circuit decision said, uh, so let me understand the state's argument. Uh, uh, straight people get drunk and pregnant, uh, and their reward is to get married. Gay people are model citizens, and their reward is to not be allowed to get married. Go figure. <laughs> right, so I think this is a very important uh, thing that happened doctrinally in 2003. I can't say that the court in 2003 had committed itself to uh, marriage equality, uh, but it took off the table the primary argument of the opponents. Well, let's fast forward to the last day of the term in June of 2013. What happens there? Uh, the court declines to decide the merits of Hollingsworth against Perry, which involved California's Proposition 8, the state ban on same-sex marriage, right? the big question on everyone's mind. And it did it uh, based on standing, and in my view, an unconvincing standing analysis. Uh, in that case, the district court had invalidated Prop 8, uh, the state officials agreed that it was unconstitutional, and they refused to defend it. Uh, and then on appeal, uh, there was a question of who had standing to appeal the district court's invalidation of Prop 8, and the official proponents of Prop 8, those who sought to defend traditional marriage, uh, intervened in the suit and argued that they had standing to defend this when the state officials wouldn't. And the court split 5-4 and said, sorry, you don't have standing. Uh, this is just a generalized grievance, even though the California Supreme Court had said it as a matter of state law, they do have the authority to defend the state constitutional amendment in court. And even though the court was 
undermining initiative and referenda processes around the country on all manner of issues, which are supposed to allow citizens to avoid the government officials if they think they're not doing their jobs. Now they depend upon the government officials to appeal an adverse decision. Uh, you put it in their hands. And so uh, I didn't think this was a particularly uh, convincing standing decision as a matter of doctrine, but the court was avoiding deciding the merits. Well, what about U.S. against Windsor? Uh, for one thing, the court didn't tell us what the level of scrutiny is for discrimination based upon sexual orientation. Is it like race? Is it like gender? Is it like everything else that gets very deferential scrutiny? Uh, the court didn't tell us. Um, what did the court tell us? It decided the merits in that case. It found that the federal definition of marriage is limited to opposite sex couples. Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act or DOMA, that violated the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. That much we knew. But the dissenters couldn't agree among themselves as to why the court had found a due process violation. And that's because the court seemed to be talking out of both sides of his mouth. Uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of traditional equal protection reasoning that DOMA had the purpose, effect, and dominant social meaning of demeaning the dignity and denying the equality of same-sex couples and their children by excluding them from an institution, namely marriage, that's not inherently unsuited to their inclusion. And that sounds like all state bans on same-sex marriage are about to be invalidated. And yet at the same time, Justice Kennedy talked a lot about federalism uh, and the traditional authority of states to defend marriage uh, and uh, seemed to suggest that one of the problems with DOMA is that Congress has intervened in some kind of highly unusual way by uh, regulating marriage, even though the states traditionally regulated marriage. And that led to an inference of animus, and that seemed to suggest, well, then maybe uh, this is a really a problem with the federal law, but not a problem with state bans on same-sex marriage. Uh, and I, I spent a lot of time puzzling over this. Uh, and in an academic article, suggested that uh, the court's behavior doesn't make any sense if you think of legal doctrine as being fully worked out at a particular point in time, if you just think of it um, statically. Rather, you have to think about it dynamically as moving in history and changing over time, that these different moves by the court, taking moral opposition off the table uh, while saying we're not talking about same-sex marriage even though you are, uh, not telling us what the level of scrutiny is, the most basic doctrinal question, uh, avoiding the merits through a questionable justiciability analysis, standing doctrine, uh, talking about federalism at the same time you're talking about equality. Uh, what I see is a court that is, uh, the way Alexander Bickel put it back in the 1960s, it's attempting to persuade before it attempts to coerce. It's trying to nudge the country in the direction of marriage equality without yet compelling it. Uh, and it's doing that um, through a, a variety of techniques, some well-known, some less well-known, uh, that have uh, the, uh, the virtues from the court's point of view of signaling uh, that the courts uh, and that litigants should be moving in a particular direction but don't yet require it to do so. And in particular, I think the so-called federalism reasoning in Windsor is indicative of the court's behavior. There's a long history in American politics of politicians using federalism as a way station, as an intermediate stopping point uh, on the way to an ultimate destination. This is what Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois did in the years before the Civil War. He was trying to hold the country together as well as the northern and southern wings of the Democratic Party by embracing popular sovereignty, federalism, as the best solution to the problem of slavery in the territories. That was the explosive constitutional question during the Constitution's first half century. Can Congress prohibit slavery in the territories? And he said, I don't have a view on this. I just want the territories to decide for themselves, popular sovereignty. Well, actually, he did have a view on this. Uh, he thought that popular sovereignty was the least controversial way to get free states, that if you let the people vote, they would vote slavery down. Uh, Lincoln recoiled at this idea. And he said, no, you have to have a view on the merits. This, you, you can't have a federalism or process solution to this issue. Fast forward to the debate over same-sex marriage. Do you remember when President Obama came out, so to speak, on national TV and talked about how he had evolved on the issue of same-sex marriage uh, and that he now personally supported it? Go look up that interview with Robin Roberts. He's talking about federalism. He says that this is a local issue. This is the way we've worked it out uh, throughout American history, and we're going to continue to work it out on a local level. Fast forward to the day Windsor is decided and the court invalidates Section 3 of DOMA. He's talking about the Declaration of Independence. 
He says that we've declared that we're all created equal and the love we give to one another has to be equal as well. He moves from a federalism frame, federalism is a way station to one equality frame, a more full-throated embrace of marriage equality. And what I would suggest is that the Supreme Court is doing roughly the same thing, from Lawrence to Windsor and Hollingsworth to Monday, October 6th, in which it denies cert uh, in seven different cases, and it knows that it's signing off on marriage equality in the 4th, 7th, and 10th circuits, and it also knows uh, that it's going to be signing off on it in the 9th circuit, because there wasn't much question about how they were going to rule. The only question was when, and it turns out it came down uh, the day after the Supreme Court denied cert. Um, if the writing wasn't on the wall before October 6th, uh, I think uh, it clearly is on the wall now, uh, with one very important exception. Uh, I think it is extraordinarily difficult for me to imagine the Supreme Court as presently constituted upholding a state ban on same-sex marriage. And I think you will get a grant just as soon as you have a circuit split, whether it's the Sixth Circuit or whether it's the Fifth Circuit or the Eleventh Circuit, or if the Eighth Circuit revisits the issue of the Eighth Circuit. We actually technically have a circuit split now. The Eighth Circuit upheld uh, a ban uh, before Windsor. We just haven't had a Court of Appeals yet do it after Windsor. I think the court will intervene at that time, and then, uh, yeah, once you get 75, 25 in favor of the court's position, uh, I think it'll, it, it'll impose a 50-state solution for the country. But the crucial qualifier is the court as presently constituted. Uh, there are many people who are now getting married just because the court denied cert, and the court knows it, meaning Kennedy, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan. And so um, they know that you can't simply put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, but I think a differently constituted court uh, if a, a Republican wins the White House in, in 2016, uh, and um, uh, if the Republicans keep uh, the Senate, and so the Republican president gets the nominee um, uh, he or she wants, and if uh, one of the members of the Windsor majority, Ken, uh, Kennedy, uh, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, leaves the court, uh, then it seems to me you have a very different ball game. Uh, I don't think a differently constituted court that agrees with the, the four conservatives who dissented in Windsor that they're going to feel obliged to declare marriage equality across the nation uh, just because um, it would be very difficult for the Supreme Court uh, to reverse course at that time. And so I think, um, as in um, all cases involving very important questions of constitutional law, uh, the public uh, American politics uh, will have the final say in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, and I want to turn it over to our special guests to talk a little bit uh, about, um, you know, we've got a good overview uh, in terms of the, the nation uh, and sort of the scholarly context and the contribution of these cases um, to the sort of uh, uh, arc of um, uh, federalism, of equal protection, due process. Uh, and uh, sort of the political, uh, the politics of the Supreme Court. I'm going to turn it over to uh, first uh, Mayor Kleinschmidt to uh, sort of talk a little bit about uh, his role in the uh, uh, litigation and then uh, to uh, Christopher Brooke about um, uh, the North Carolina specific litigation as well. Thanks, great. Um, I can be heard just speaking like this. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, I remember back when Amendment 1 was first passed and the conversations we had, and I remember trying to organize conversations with lawyers across the state, telling everybody, just take a deep breath, and, and I was reminded of that, Elizabeth, when you said, you know, bad law could, you know, could happen, and that was our greatest fear after Amendment 1, but my law partners and I were still very anxious to figure out a way to get a case in front of a, a good judge where we could make good law. But we were terrified at, at, uh, on the, uh, the day after Amendment 1 passed that somebody else was going to make really bad law. And um, I think we, we talked, I mean, a lot of us who were involved in LGBT issues in North Carolina um, had those conversations. And so we started looking for them. And um, the uh, ACLU got ahead. Um, he had some great plaintiffs um, and went, went forward in the Middle District. And so we were, we were, you know, we were pleased initially um, in our office um, the, with the work the ACLU was doing. But we also started noticing that around the country, most states had more than one approach, you know, as far as, um, you know, trying to get a, uh, get a judge to, you know, to say, to finally say yes. And you know, so they were all, they were, everyone was throwing in different bait, you know, in various states. And it was just, you know, which judge 
fish is going to bite. And so we, we had, when we were exploring the issue of doing a case ourselves, we were looking for an alternative uh, approach um, uh, to marry a 14th Amendment claim with something else, and that would be our judge bait. Um, we watched the ACLU, you know, attach it to the um, uh, adoption issues, which were very, were very compelling. And we thought, and in conversation with with religious leaders around the state, that we could make the First Amendment our our judge bait. And um, in that case, and, I, and you know, I confess right now, we won, we won. So I'll tell you now, I, it's a stretch. I get that. In the Q&A, I don't need you to tell me, hey, that's a stretch. I know it's a stretch. <laughs> but here's, here's, the deal, here's the theory, right? So in North Carolina, we have these really weird statutes that govern how marriages have to happen. And so there's only two kinds of people in North Carolina who are, who are allowed to actually um, uh, conduct a marriage, and they're magistrates and um, uh, uh, ministers. And... Um, and by the way, if any of you are trying to get your online minist you know, ministerial credentials, don't try to marry anybody with them. That's a whole other issue we can go into later. <laughs> Those are, that, that will not constitute a real uh, a legal marriage in North Carolina. So don't do that. Don't get married by a universal life minister. But um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, because it's only ministers and um, magistrates, you know, and ministers you know, they want to be able to perform these marriages. And, the, the, and for either one of them to actually conduct a legal marriage, they have to have a, a, a license in their hand. You know, they have to be presented a license. Here, a couple comes to minister, here's our license, conduct the marriage. If they don't receive a license, a, a legal license, then they, and they conduct the marriage anyway, they're committing a misdemeanor. And they're subject to civil penalties. So like, hmm... Well, here, you know, congregants go to their, are going to their ministers, and they have been for years, decades, here in North Carolina, asking to be married. And ministers are doing it because they're getting authority from their own religious, uh, you know, from their denominations to do so, and they're conducting these in-name marriages. Um, and no one had ever been prosecuted, but, um, and no one had ever been sued. But we decided to tell the Western District this has a chilling effect on, uh, on their free speech rights, their religious freedom rights, and their, uh, their assembly rights. And um, that was our bait. And that's why it was the United Church of Christ versus Cooper. And the United Church of Christ was so enthusiastic about this that they wanted us to move faster than we had actually planned to. Um, and, um, uh, you know, but we had the entire national denomination on board. Uh, they had been conducting, and they had been in a welcoming church since 1993, and they were looking to be a real player. So that was our judge bait. Um, when it came down to what actually won, it was, as you know, a 14th, the 14th Amendment claim, like the same claim that won everywhere else. Um, and, you know, there was, you know, you, the, your map is really interesting, but the mo really the most interesting legal experience I've had was living, being alive in front of my computer, editing pleadings on 10, 10, 14, a day I'm never going to forget. Um, and, um, you know, filing papers in the morning. And then, um, you know, by 5.32 in the afternoon, I could get married. I mean, it was just like, it was really just extraordinary. Um, and we thought that uh, uh, the ACLU was going to get ahead of us. We had a, a judge change, though, in the middle of the week. So after, <laughs> after Bostic cert was denied... Um, uh, our judge, uh, Reisinger, um, who I believe, I have no evidence of this, but I believe has a personal relationship with the parties who are trying to intervene in our case, namely the Speaker and um, uh, President Pro Tem of the North Carolina Senate, um, recused himself, and he dumped it on to Cogburn. And Cogburn, who was an Obama um, uh, appointee, which I don't think has anything to do with that, I think he's just a good judge, he... Um, he, he looked at our case and quickly dispensed of the motions and denied the intervention at like, you know, well, like 5.15 and um, by 5.32 was granting marriage equality. Um, and so you know, that's kind of, that's how our case worked. 
Um, I don't think we were the only uh, group in the country to kind of get into court on a, you know, in, in, a, in an odd and unusual way, like with our First Amendment claim. But um, it worked. It caught the attention of of people around the state and around the country because it had a it had you know even once we gained marriage equality at 532 on 1010 you know we could legally get married or marriage it, it was happening in North Carolina and literally began in 533 but the hearts and minds that supported the passage of amendment 1 um, the that supported politicians who were seeking to intervene in our case I mean that was going to take a lot longer um, it's going to take a lot longer to change those hearts and minds to come around to understanding that this is okay, that the sky isn't going to fall. And having the UCC and the other churches, which, by the way, there were, there were many others that eventually joined the case, um, it's become, become a vehicle for the cultural change that has to follow the granting of marriage equality. So we were, that's part of why we were so grateful to have um, the religious community as part of our, our suit. Um, so I just want to I want to start uh, by just giving a shout out to the pro se litigants um, who uh, also litigated in this case, but also so I could flag the hilarious title of their litigation because it's McCrory versus Cooper. Um, uh, one of the one of the uh, women who wanted to have her marriage recognized is named Carol McCrory. Um, so it was McCrory versus Cooper, which uh, if you're a North Carolinian like I am, is just really hilarious. So. I was, kind of for non-self-interested purposes, hoping that case would win, so <laughs> McCrory versus Cooper could strike down Amendment 1, because that would have been pretty rich. Um, you know, everybody's covered a lot of the, 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 the key ground running up to uh, October 10th. I'll just real briefly talk about what's happened since October 10th in the past month, because I, I think it's, it's interesting and, and, and very telling. So, the, the, you know, the first, and go through a couple of players here and how they've responded to this. Uh, the first player to highlight is, is Governor McCrory, whose next race will be, you know, running for re-election statewide in 2016. And the way he responded uh, subsequent to the October 10th decision was to say, I personally disagree with this decision, but this is how democracy operates. The courts have now spoken. Marriages should go forward. And over the course, October 10th was a Friday. Um, uh, marriages started in, in Buncombe and Guilford and Wake County that evening, um, but did not start in the other 97 counties until Monday morning. Over that weekend, uh, he had a number of his administrative agencies basically you know, tell state actors that they were obligated uh, to follow uh, the court's mandate and Judge Cogburn's mandate. Very interesting. Uh, around the same time, uh, the lieutenant governor of the state is named Dan Forrest, whose next race will be most likely, you know, a 2020 race for governor uh, in a Republican primary, sent out, did you see his email that he sent out, a fundraising email? It's batshit insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was like one of those things where you're like, I think that there's blood coming out of my ears because this makes so little sense, it is insane. So, I mean, first he went with the very typical, like, liberal and elected judges, what do you know? Um, and, you know, that makes perfect sense, right? Uh, was, it, was, uh, was confirmed 97 to 0. He's a liberal and elected judge, you know, ruling by fiat, Mark. Um, set aside the fact that the judge in our case, who uh, dawdled on our case forever, uh, was it two years? Two years. <laughs> uh, 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 was a George W. Bush appointee, and and you know th this is if you're a lawyer an insulting argument because once the Fourth Circuit um, rules, district court judges have no option but to comply with that ruling. So that he's just essentially preying on lay people's ignorance of how the law operates there. But then he also went into like the North Carolina Supreme Court could undo this decision by interpreting our constitution, which I, I, I think is basically a nullification argument, which my understanding is we fought a war um, that was relatively long and bloody to try to figure out that particular issue and that that argument lost that side. I don't know that the lieutenant governor is a history buff. Um, that's telling. And then the Senate pro tem leader, a couple of Fridays ago, 
uh, wrote a letter to the administrative office of the courts, uh, which governs uh, court officials throughout the state, including magistrates. And magistrates, the, the great thing about being involved in these cases is learning all of the weird nooks and crannies about how things operate in state bureaucracy. Magistrates have eight million responsibilities. One of those responsibilities is they're the officials who officiate civil uh, weddings. And uh, the AOC came out and said, you know, it, is there a valid reason, this is literally the Q&A, is there a valid reason to not perform these marriages? Question, answer, no. Very categorical and absolutely right. Uh, Senator Berger and 26 other members of the Republican caucus in the North Carolina Senate wrote to the AOC arguing that they uh, had ignored uh, their, uh, the magistrate's religious liberty rights. Um, in direct contravention to what Governor McCrory had said. Because Governor McCrory had said, these are state actors whose, state, whose highest obligation is to the United States Constitution, which has been definitively interpreted in this case. So, um, you know, government officials don't get to choose which laws that they're going to respect, which is exactly what Senator Berger uh, is arguing. Um, AOC has stood up. Uh, to uh, that sort of bullying tactic very uh, admirably because the Senate plays a large role in the sort of funding AOC uh, gets. Um, but, you know, they did that right before the election. Um, shock, shock, shock. Um, and we've had 11 magistrates resign since the decision was, uh, was reached on October 10th. That's a little bit less than 1.5% of the magistrates. So you might say this is all a theoretical exercise, and in a, in a lot of ways it is. But in Durham County, there are about a dozen magistrates. So if you come in, you know, there's going to be a magistrate there who can officiate your wedding. But if you live in a rural county, there, you know, Graham County, North Carolina, out west, has two magistrates. So if one of those magistrates is just not going to marry same-sex couples, you know, not only is that demeaning the dignity of same-sex couples in Graham County, but it's also making it exceptionally difficult for them to actually get their marriage recognized in the county that they live in because they got to plan for when the other magistrate is there and not dealing with, you know, some other matter that's part of their myriad responsibilities. But I, I tell this story to sort of highlight that there's some politicking going on and it's happening in, in one particular subset uh, of uh, ideological subset in our state. But I do think that Governor McCrory's very muted and, and actually pretty responsible response is a pretty good indication that at the upper echelons, there's a, a real understanding of the way this discussion is going, not only nationally, but also in North Carolina, which, you know, given that we're, you know, only two years away from Amendment 1 is a very striking development. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that's a, that I mean, it's, it's true about um, uh, what you said, uh, and it's sort of striking about how uh, we're in an environment in which um, I think, as you said, the sort of hearts and minds have yet to be won over, no matter what the law is, um, uh, as declared by the Fourth Circuit. So uh, with that, I'll open up the, the floor to Q&A. Um, uh, my, my colleague Neil is going to have to leave, um, unfortunately. I will try to field whatever sort of big picture theoretical questions you have, but I'll fail miserably. So don't make me look foolish. Um, <laughs> but for, the, for, um, for our panelists and for our guests, um, uh, who has questions? I'll, I'll, I can keep the queue. So, no questions. There. Um, excuse me. Uh, I was wondering if you could, anybody really, could comment on in U.S. v. Windsor the Obama administration's sort of unique approach to DOMA and believing it to be unconstitutional, but defending it selectively so that they could get into the Supreme Court and sort of get perhaps. Was a maybe politically motivated litigation strategy there. Yeah, I think it's important to accurately state what the administration decided, right? So they didn't, um, uh, they decided that they were not going to defend it in litigation because uh, it was their judgment that it was unconstitutional and they faced that question when they were in a circuit, namely the Second Circuit, that had not yet decided what the level of scrutiny would be. 
And so the administration had to decide what the level of scrutiny they thought it should be, and they said heightened scrutiny. And there was no one, uh, no way to defend it under heightened scrutiny. They continued to enforce it, not selectively, but across the board, which is why Edith Windsor didn't get the $363,053 back, uh, the tax refund back, until the litigation was resolved. And that was done, it's controversial uh, and it's unusual, but that was done out of respect for the Congress that passed DOMA that it should be enforced until such time, as well as respect for the ultimate authority of the courts to determine its constitutionality, right? So it was a compromise position. Uh, enforce it until the courts tell us no, um, but refuse to defend it in court because we have our own constitutional obligations to discharge. You know, which I think, um, like sort of the next flavor of that, you know, is the Attorney General of North Carolina, Cooper, who, uh, you know, long said that he did not personally think that um, Amendment 1 was constitutional, um, but he not only, you know, enforced it, um, but went to court and made arguments defending it, saying, you know, in my role as an attorney general, I should defend the laws of the state, but, you know, my personal belief is that it's not constitutional. But the, the first ruling from Cogburn on 1010 was around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, granting um, Cooper the right to change um, the okay. caption of the case to... Um, uh, in, to to designate him as an intervener, as opposed to uh, defendant, so because he, he didn't want to be, he knew it was coming down, and so he didn't want to be uh, a, a true defendant. So actually, it ends up being um, the UCC versus Ridinger, whatever the, the bunk, Risinger, the the uh, Register of Deeds um, in Buncombe County, who was very happy to have his name on that because he was actually not not because he wanted to really defend it. He, went, he was just, he's just really pleased to be part of history because he was sitting there waiting for that moment to happen. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, do you see problems arising in states that don't prohibit sexual orientation discrimination in things like employment or housing that will now allow same-sex marriage and things like places like Oklahoma where they passed their marriage ban in a presidential election year, like, I think like 76 to 24? Yeah, uh, here. Um, <laughs> this is, we, uh, Chris and I are dealing with some intakes right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, no, North Carolina is a state that um, doesn't prohibit employment discrimination, um, uh, you know, doesn't have uh, uh, civil rights laws that extend uh, to discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, you know, there's a couple ways to tackle those problems. I mean, ideally, we would um, have, you know, more state legislatures continue to adopt non-discrimination protections. And, and we're working on that. I mean, there has been movement. Um, you know, we still push for municipalities to adopt local non-discrimination ordinances. Um, there's been a wave of recent success in Idaho, for example. Um, and, and so, you know, there's going to be a legislative strategy to that um, work as well. But then I think there's you know, we will see where the law develops. Um, the EEOC, the, the federal EEOC, um, has taken, uh, it, um, has has made arguments and, and the Department of Education, so federal EEOC enforces Title VII, um, the Department of Education enforces Title IX, and are both pushing um, the boundaries in terms of those statutes on what actually constitutes sex discrimination. Um, and from where I sit as a person who does um, work on LGBT equality and reproductive justice and women's rights, um, frankly, all of the discrimination in all of these areas is based on gender stereotyping. So I think um, you know, extending an idea of sex protection to be um, maximally uh, encompassing of gender stereotyping, that actually covers a lot, or if not all, of <coughs> sexual orientation discrimination. So we are working on pushing the law forward in that area as well. Um, in, and, and so if we could get Title VII <laughs> um, to, to apply, that would be great. I think you know there would also be a federal legislative strategy in terms of ENDA, that is pretty much dead. So um, you know, maybe we will get back to a point where it is, there is a possibility of a federal end up passing. Um, I think what is looking most promising right now is um, in a state like North Carolina would be expanding municipal protections, um, which there are already a solid set of here, um, and, and then also working um, with the federal courts um, to try to expand, uh, broaden the concept of what constitutes sex discrimination. With that, uh it's the witching hour. Uh, to apologies to anybody who want to ask a question. Thank you to the panel and our guests.